Sir Ruel, pa-accept po yung isa kong account. Good evening, Doc. Good evening, Sir Ruel. Could you please accept my, ano, my other account? My Zoom account. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Owen Pantilio once again, and welcome to another review session here at Teacher A Online Review Center, where a dreamer becomes an achiever. To begin our session for, for today, may I ask about what you take with us in the opening prayer? Ma'am Joan. Ma'am Joan, can you lead us in the opening prayer? Hello, good evening, Doc. Good evening. Okay, let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity in which we gather again to have our let review in English. Hope, Lord, that let the Holy Spirit to enlighten our mind, to let all the lessons that we encountered to retain in our mind and hearts, so that we can remember all of these discussions during during examination. Give us always, Lord, a strength, courage, confidence, and trust to ourselves that we will pass the coming examination. Bless also, Lord, the organizers, our professor, or our lecturer, Dr. 
uh, Dr. Rowena, and to all organizers in this organization. This we ask and thanks in the name of our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. For today's review, we'll be focusing on English majorship. So if you have friends or relatives who are majoring in English, kindly share the, the FB Live. It's very generous of Teacher A to have this uh, review session available to all. So let's get started with our first question. When we had the last uh, review for English majorship, I asked you for certain areas of difficulties and you have mentioned campus journalism, stylistics and discourse, pragmatics, and um, a certain, what else did you mention? Literary criticism. So tonight or th this afternoon, okay, wherever you are in the world, we will try to cover all those topics in, in our three hour review. So let's, let's start with question number one. This is for campus journalism. Okay. It is the large heading giving the publication or paper's name on the front page. What do you call this part of the newspaper? Okay. The large heading giving the publication or paper's name on the front page. A, is it the nameplate? B, the masthead? C, the slug line? Or letter D, the printer's direction? What's your answer? You can type the letter of your answer in the chat box or the comment section for those who are watching via Facebook Live. Great. So let's see. The correct answer is letter, no answer yet from Facebook. Enroll is in Zoom or answering letter A. Let's see if they are correct. Okay. The correct answer is A, nameplate. Okay. Sometimes it causes confusion between nameplate and masset as those two terms are used interchangeably. But what is really the difference? Let us review the uh, basic parts of a newspaper. Earlier, um, the part written in bold letters bearing the name of the newspaper is called the nameplate. What's the difference? A masthead contains the nameplate, but it could also contain other information about the newspaper. For example, it can also function as the pug. When we say pug, it is the part of um, the masthead that bears the price and the date of uh, the newspaper. What else? We also have what we call as the uh, headline. As you can see here, the headline serves as the title of the of the news report. So the headline is usually written or always written in bold letters or bigger than the font size of the actual uh, news article. Okay, we also have here. Can you name or can you mention one part of a newspaper that you can see in the presentation? Byline, incentive. Okay, what is stated or what can we see in that part? The incentive? What can we see in that part? Uh, 10 free songs. Okay. All right, 10 free songs. The incentive provides encouraging content okay, or certain catchy content that would attract the buyer's attention. Okay, so that's incentives. In, in here, 10 free songs inside. What else? The byline. What is written in the byline? Or what can we find in the, uh, the byline? What can we find in the byline? The byline bears the name of the writer. Okay, the name of the writer. What else? Images. Okay, or image is also called the cut. So it contains photo that would uh, that is connected to the news report. Okay. What else? What part can you see here? What other parts can you see here? We have also the date 
and edition of the newspaper are usually part of the masthead. All right, those are the common parts of the newspaper. And the parts of the newspaper sometimes differ depending on the type of newspaper. Okay. A newspaper can be classified as tabloid or gold sheet. What are the differences between the two? Tabloids, in terms of the use of language, tabloids have shorter sentences in the paragraphs and, and paragraphs, and it uses basic vocabulary. Compared to a broadsheet, where in sentences are longer and more complicated, and the vocabulary will be uh, more advanced because it depends on its target market or target reader. In tabloids, reports are sensationalized and uh, are using emotive language, while in broadsheet, the tone is more formal and serious. The focus of tabloids usually are gossips okay, or uh, sensationalized news, while broadsheets focus on important national and international issues. Okay, so those are the differences. Now let's proceed to the next question. In 1882, Another nationalistic newspaper known as Diario Tagalog was founded. The question is, who is the founder of the said publication? Who is the founder of Diario Tagalog? A. Marcelo H. Del Pilar. B. Graciano Lopez Jaina. C. Dr. Jose Rizal. And letter D. Emilio J. Jacinto. The question is, who is the founder? of Diario Tagalog. Ayan, you have the same answer. And that's actually is the correct answer. Marcelo H. Del Pilar. Can I ask someone to read this from Zoom? Um, Ms. Gretchen, yeah. For greater enlightenment, let's have a background on Jari Yung Tagalog. Yes, ma'am. The man considered by many as the father of Philippine journalism is the lawyer Mar Marcelo H. Del Pilar. It was in 1882 when Rizal was already in Europe when Del Pilar published the first Tagalog Spanish newspaper called Diaryong Tagalog. In, in its, he used the language of the people to expose the abuses of the friars. The foreignity only lasted five months but made a big impact. When his publication and activities against the friars endangered his life, he made a painful decision to leave the Philippines in 1888. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gretchen. So from what Ms. Gretchen had read, okay, we have their very important uh, details for you to remember. Number one, aside from being the founder of Diadong Tagalog, Marcelo H. Del Pilar is also the father of Philippine journalism. And Diadong Tagalog is the very first newspaper published in uh, Tagalog and Spanish. And it only lasted, or its publication only lasted for five months. Okay, take note of those. Okay, next, this is question number three. It is a type of article specifically written to present facts and event, events during language, using language understandable to grassroots level. A, news story. B, editorial. C, feature story. D, Lola Bashan story. Again, what type of article is specifically written to present facts and events using language understandable to grassroots or meaning basic level? What's your answer? The correct answer is there's a little delay in in Facebook. Ayan, I'm seeing your answer now. Uh, JP Balapo answered letter A. Same with me. And the correct answer is yes, a news story. Yeah. A news story is um, written in order to report events, okay, factual events, and it made use of basic for simple, easily understandable language. So what are the different articles that we read in a newspaper? 
Okay. Number one, news article, a news report. It's usually found on the front page of a newspaper. The goal of a news report is to inform readers about things that are happening in the world or in their local area or locality. It is, yes, full of facts like names, dates, and places, and tend to have a more formal and neutral tone. On the other hand, feature articles explore the issues raised by news stories in more depth. It tends to be more opinionated and less for formal than a report. It's often taking a personal point of view. And um, editorials are pieces by personality writers, often celebrities in other fields, or uh, the editors are column writers. They're written to inform because the writer's expert opinion is valued to entertain because the writer has a comic or interesting way of describing everyday life. Or um, this is written by columnists develop a style. In this one, columnists develop a style okay, or of their own. For example, um, pole polemical or sarcastic style. They create this style through vocabulary choices and rhetorical devices. So for editorials, the language or the tone could be formal or informal, depending on, uh, depending on the purpose of the writer. Okay? If the purpose is to entertain, then uh, you can expect um, an informal tone. But if the purpose is to, to inform or give an expert opinion about a, a very important issue, then we can expect a more formal uh, tone or choice of words. Okay. And um, the idiolect of the author or the writer is very evident in editorials. Okay. Um, English majors, what do we mean by idiolect? What do you mean by idiolect? I'm sure you have encountered this term uh, in your uh, in your structure of English language, uh, structure of language subject. What is an idiolect? Any idea? What's an idiolect? A speech habit. Okay. An idiolect is like our um, thumb mark. It is unique from one person to, to another. It's one's unique way of speaking or use of, of language. We can, we can easily identify a person with his choice of words or with his manner of speaking or use of language, and that's an idiolet. Okay, let's have question number four. Uh, what do you call the special area of assignment given to reporters? Okay, writer's own style, correct. Okay, what is the special area of assignment given to reporters? Letter A, box. Letter B, beat. Letter C, angle. Letter D, territory. Angle. Area of assignment. Area of assignment. Uh, territory. Territory. Is it area, no? Or what do you... Okay. Angle. Angle of angle. Uh, let's see. Okay, the correct answer actually is B. Now, let us define the other options, okay, especially your angle. Okay, territory is just a distractor. So we can we would most likely choose it because of the keyword area. But of course, in campus journalism, it is laden with jargons. Okay, and the jargons or the definition of those jargons are are most of the time far from its um, far from from their uh, from their denotative meaning. Okay, so let's talk about angle. When we say angle, this is the main idea of a new story. The lead is called the angle because it is the main point that the rest of the story will try to support. So the angle of the story is oftentimes as stated. In the, in the lead, and the rest of the paragraphs will just support the angle. So um, the correct answer for that is, uh, I'm sorry, okay. the correct answer for that is B. Okay. Next, 
I think I have shown the correct answer. It is a name given to a person who is authorized to send news from out-of-town points or a reporter stationed in capitals of the provinces or prominent areas. A, editor. B, cameraman. C, crew or D, correspondent. Ayan. Kung mabilis yung mata nyo, nakita nyo na yung correct answer kanina. The correct answer. Editor, cameraman, crew or correspondent. A person is authorized to send news from out of town points or a reporter stationed in capitals of the provinces or prominent areas. The correct answer is, yeah, a, that person is called a correspondent. Okay, next. We often see the acronym AP in newspapers. The question is, what does AP stand for? A, Araling Panlipunan. B, American Psychology. Letter C, Associated Press. Or letter D, Assistant Professor. The acronym AP, which is commonly seen in newspapers as sources of stories or photos, stands for what? Araling Panlipunan. American Psychology. C, Associated Press. Or D, Assistant Professor. The correct answer is, ayan. the correct answer is, yes, Associated Press. What is Associated Press? Let's, more, let's learn more about it. Um, Sir Daryl, uh, Daryl John Virai, could you please tell us about Associated Press? Associated Press. Can you read, uh, read about Associated Press? Associated Press is an independent global news organization dedicated to a factual reporting, founded in 1846. AP Today remains the most trusted source of fast, accurate, and biased news in all formats and essential providers of the technology and services vital to the news businesses. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Dariel. So remember that AP stands for Associated Press, okay? the most reliable or trusted source of fast, accurate, and unbiased news in all formats globally. Okay, number seven question. It is a last-minute news regarding some important development in a story. Usually kasi, um, for example, in Manila Bulletin or international local uh, local newspapers that published on a daily basis, minsan okay na, ready na for publication yung, yung mga news stories. And then may bago, mainit, mainit na balita talagang papasok. Okay. So ano yung tawag natin doon? yung last-minute news regarding some important development. Do we call that A, bulletin? Letter B, clips? Letter C, fold? Or letter D, kicker? Last-minute news regarding some important development in a story. Na kahit na nakalayout na yung issue for tomorrow, they would have to act uh, out. Um, provide space for, for this uh, last minute and very important news. Okay, the correct answer is, kanina pa to, ang galing ni um, Mr. JP Malapo, letter A bulletin. Yes, that is the correct answer. Ano naman yung mga ibang options? Let us, uh, let us define them. Okay, let's start with uh, bulletin. It's a brief, prominently featured newspaper account based upon information received just before the edition went to press. When we say clipping, these are actually cutouts, articles from a newspaper publication. So why do they, uh, why do, uh, they make clippings? Newspaper clippings are often used when people have to write a report or make a presentation on current events for school. Clippings may also be kept by adults for future reference or for sentimental reasons such as an article on a history-making event. Okay, yung mga news clippings, yung mga kinakat natin na part ng newspaper. Yung iba, 
uh, for future reference, we're keeping it for documentation, or iba naman as memorabilia. Especially, diba, kunyari, na-feature kayo sa isang, sa isang uh, newspaper and you want to keep it. So you get, uh, you, you cut it and that would be called as, called as clipping, newspaper clipping. What, have, what about the intro, the deck, or the kicker? So the kicker or the intro gives a summary of what is expected from the article and should work together with the headline. And because of this, it is almost always the best thing, but not always, ah, to place it below the headline. Okay. In this one, which part is the kicker? Dun sa example sa right side. What's the kicker? Can someone read? Alin ba dun yung kicker? Miss Ching Ching, Carly, Carly. Alin dito ang, ang uh, kicker? Nandiyan ka ba, Miss Ching Ching? Sino ba? Sir Dennis, pakibasa nga yung kicker doon sa sample ng, ng news report sa right side. Sir Dennis. Logo, ma'am? Pakibasa Sorry, yung kicker. Al alin daw yung kicker doon? Sabi dito, the kicker gives a summary of what is expected from the article and it should work together with the headline. Okay, can you please read the kicker in the given uh, sample? Alin dun yung kicker? Di ko po mamalam, ma'am. Okay. Uh, sino ba idea? Which one is the kicker there? This is a sports news. Alin doon yung kicker? The phrase underlined. Correct. Five wicket victory over RR takes CSK to top point table. Yun yung kicker. Okay. Usually, yun yung mas maliit ng konti na na phrase okay, on top or below the headline. Next, question number eight. It is otherwise known as run over. It is a headline for a story that is continued from one page to another. Letter A, box story. Letter B, umbrella headline. Letter C, running story. Letter D, jump head. It is otherwise known as a run over. The headline for a story that is continued from one page to another. Do we call that the box story, umbrella headline, running story, or letter D jump head? Kasi nakakonfuse talaga yung mga jargon sa campus journalism. So I provided a lot of items covering, uh, covering these. Ano yun? It's the correct answer. That is, I only see a few responses sa chat box. Ano, mahirap. Nakalimutan na natin. Di ba? Isang semester yan sa college, yung campus journalism. Medyo mahirap ba? What's the correct answer? That is jump head. Okay. Let's uh, discuss this. Ano yung jump head? Ano yung jump line? In newspapers, sometimes the, the space would not be enough to, to write or to, to include all the details of a news report. So ito yung tinatawag na continuation. Yung jump line. It says where to find the continuation of that news report. For example, C, B, 12. That means C, uh, C, page B, number 12. Or section B on page 12 yung ibig sabihin nun. Or kapag sa continuation, may nakalagay na from B3. 
that means that is the continuation of a news report from page or uh, from section B of page 3. Okay, ano naman yung jump head? Okay, ano naman yung jump head? Pag ikinuntinyo na yung news report, they get a certain single word or a short phrase from the whole uh, headline to show na ito yung continuation or to indicate that this is the continuation of that news article na pinutol. Okay? So, a jump head, yun yung headline or yung second page of an article after it jumps. Kaya siya tinawag na jump head. Okay? Next. What do you call the first, alam na alam niyo to, wala sigurong mamamali. What do you call the first paragraph of a new story? A. Head. B. Lead. C. Cut. D. Slug. What is the first paragraph of a new story? Head. Lead. Cut. Or slug. Okay. The correct answer is yes, lead. Okay. So a news article structure is an inverted pyramid. Can someone explain yung inverted pyramid? Okay, nga. I believe lahat kayo familiar dito. How does it work, yung inverted pyramid? At bakit ba inverted pyramid yung structure na isang news article? Any volunteer? Any volunteer? Bakit inverted pyramid? Yeah, let's talk about this. Why is a news article written in the inverted pyramid structure? Doc, um, yes, for okay. me, the um, inverted pyramid kasi um, the most important information is at the beginning. Uh, it is just the same uh, constructing paragraph in which from the most important to the less important. <laughs> okay, so that's right. The most important details are on the first paragraph. And as we read through the news report, diminishing na yung importance ng mga information na ipinoprovide. Why is that, why is that? so? Um, it's contrary or it's the opposite of, uh, of the structure of narratives or yung mga creative writing uh, genres. Bakit? Usually pag creative writing, you, come, you start with an introduction and then you go to the climax until you reach the resolution or ending of a story. Sa news article, um, it's the other way around. You start with the juiciest or the most important part. Bakit? Because in a news report, of course, readers would want to know the essential, uh, the essential details. It hooks the readers. And ang mga nagbabasa naman ng dyaryo, hindi sila nagbabasa uh, talaga for ang main purpose nila sa pagbabasa, hindi naman entertainment. That is to get informed. So you feed them right away the most import, important information. And those, those important information are found in the lead. It answers the WH questions. The who, what, when, where, why, how. And then you provide supporting details, the second paragraph, and then background details, the third paragraph, the general details up to the least important information. So yung mga interviews, okay, mga less important interviews, or yung mga rela uh, related events, usually nilalagay natin yan dun sa uh, bottom of the pyramid. Bakit ganon? Aside from ang nagbabasa ng mga newspapers, of course, or after the uh, important information or key information, bakit, pa in uh, bakit ba pa-inverted pyramid ang, ang structure ng news article? Meron pa isang reason doon. Not only for the readers, 
but also on the part of the editors or in the layout artist. Bakit kaya? Ba't ganon? Bakit pa inverted pyramid? To attract the readers, uh, yeah. Okay. Aside from that, apart from it's con uh, considerate sa needs or sa, sa intention ng reader sa pagbabasa ng mga balita, ano pa? Meron yung purpose eh. Abay pa! Early ano, earlier, di ba, we mentioned about bulletin. Yung mga last minute news articles. Yung ito publish na, i-release na yung, yung, yung newspaper, yung issue the following day, tas may pumasok ng na importanteng balita, yung bulletin. When, when such cases happen, mag, magiging madali sa layout artist or sa editor if naka-inverted pyramid yung structure. Ibig sabihin, all the editor needs to do is to remove the bottom part. Hindi na kailangan i-rephrase, i-reword, or i-summarize ulit yung, yung first, second, third paragraph. Hindi na nila gagalawin yun. All they have to do is to remove the bottom part. So, for example, there are four news articles in the front page para mabigyan ng space yung bulletin, yung bagong pasok na mahalagang balita, babawasan na lang nila ng paragraph sa bottom. So, bawas sa bottom paragraph ng news 1, bottom paragraph ng news 2, news 3, news 4, and then you have a space for the bulletin. Or, <laughs> ma'am, uh, please mute your, your microphone. Ma'am Charissa Jane. Okay. So that's the, that's the reason Ayan, so that the readers will avoid this right po. So that the readers will avoid confusion and directly get the article. Yes. Um that's uh one reason uh, Joe Yano for the sake of the, the readers. Pero para din yan sa editor, para din sa layout artist, tatanggalin natin yung bottom paragraph to give space for a bulletin or for an additional news report. Okay. No problem po. All right. So let's review again um, sa options. Nabanggit na naman yung iba't ibang parts ng newspaper. A cut is another term or uh, the term for photo. Yung mga images na nilalagay natin as, uh, as part of the news article, we call that cut. Okay. Ano naman yung tawag natin doon sa caption under the image? What do you call that caption under the image? Diba? There's this picture and then there's a caption. Caption usually in italicized letter. We call that caption in campus journalism the cut line. Okay? Cut yung image, yung photo. Cut line would be the caption. If there's photo credits, okay, yung to, to, uh, to state or to provide the name of the photographer, okay, we also uh, call that photo credits. Okay, what else? Yung lead, yung first paragraph ng news, ng news report. Okay, jump line, alam na yan. Okay, what else? We have also the, the byline, the name of the, the writer, the newspaper writer, the nameplate or the master. All right, next. The date line. The words at the beginning of the news article, news article that tells when and uh, where the article was written. Minsan, ang date line nilalagay nila okay, under the byline. Sometimes, it's also part of the first paragraph, the lead. Minsan, di ba, may magbasa tayo na, ano, na lead mag-start sa Makati City, tapos dash, then start na nung, nung, nung lead. Okay, start na ng first paragraph. And that's what we call as a date line. Okay, although it's called a date line, it may also provide the place where the article was written. Okay. Next, um, yung angles. Nabanggit kanina yung word na angle. Okay. Again, the angle is the focus or uh, uh, the focus of the news report. It tells what is um, what is the the most important or what is the author or the news writer trying to, to 
uh, make the readers understand. An angle or a news report or an event could be taken in different angles. Parang ganito lang yan. Nag-interview ka, nag-interview ka na isang prominent personality. Sa dami ng sinabi niya, hindi naman yung lahat ay ilalagay mo sa inyong news report. Kukuha ka lang ng certain angle that you think would be most interesting para sa mga readers. ba? Diba? Sa SONA, ang dami, ang haba ng speech for, for how many hours nag-speech ang president. But of course, they will just get the best angles or the part of the speech that would be most interesting for the people to read. Okay. And there are 10 frequently used angles by, uh, by news reporters. We have what we call as the new development. It brings forward new information to an existing story or expose the entire, uh, an entirely original new story. So yung mga, uh, yung mga events na development or parang continuation or progression ng no mga previously controversial news, yun, kinukunan nila ng ganang angle, yung news, new development. Or if the news is or the event is an entirely original story. Okay. We also have human interest. Ibig sabihin, reporters would, uh, would also choose to write about stories wherein it tackles stories that tackle social issues or discusses a person in an emotional way as to generate interest or empathy in the reader. Okay. Paano naman yung local angle? Local angle describes how the local community or economy will be Affected. Pag progress, it demonstrates human innovation, positive interactions, or willingness to meet the challenge presented. Pag consequence, it relates a group or organization to an existing news event, usually describing how it's being affected by previous announcement or occurrence. We also have eminence or prominence. Discusses emerging trends, usually informing the reader of why the trend is popular and what it means to them. And conflict explains a controversy often with opposing viewpoints and positions. Drama describes a conflict like to invoke an emotional response or provide an editorial of such events. Pag sinabi natin disaster, describes the impact of negative situations and uh, usually either what brought them about or how it's affecting the subject or what's being done about it. But timing and proximity uh, relates a particular story, often warnings or advice to a specific region or event, such as holiday or season. So yun yung mga angles na tinitignan ng mga news writers or reporters. I will show you headlines and I want you to determine kung anong angle ang, ang dynamic doon. Ng mga, ng news reporter. Let's start with this one. Rodi signs law allowing firemen to carry guns. Yun yung headline. Ano kayang angle ng story? Or ano kayang uh, focus ng story? Is it new development? Human interest? Okay. Local angle? Progress? Consequence? Prominence? Conflict? Drama? Disaster? Timing and proximity? What do you think? Ayan yung headline. Brody signs law allowing firemen to carry guns. Number one, is it new development? Pag sinabi natin new development, yeah, all right. Pag sinabi natin new development, it brings forward new information to an existing story or exposes an entirely new story. Yung iba, anong sagot? Local angle. So that means pag local angle describes how the community the local community or economy will be affected. What about the others? A human interest. 
would relate the story to social issues or discusses a person in an emotional way to generate empathy in the reader. Okay, yun kaya yun? Consequence relates a group or organization to an existing news event, usually describing describing how it's being affected by a previous announcement or occurrence. All right. So possible answer, possible angle would be new development or consequence. How about this one? Vog returns as Taal Volcano Sulfur Dioxide rises on September 14. Vog returns as Taal Volcano Sulfur Dioxide rises on September 14. Anong angle? Ito ay interesting para sa tao because of... Okay, so obviously, it's number nine, disaster. Uh, this one, kids have been taken into care due to their parents' tele-addiction. Kids have been taken into care due to their parents' tele-addiction or addiction to television. It is? What's the correct answer? Yeah, number two. The answer is human interest. Next, Jamil, magbabalik sa vlogging. Jamil, magbabalik sa vlogging. It's number... I don't forgot. Disaster. <laughs> Disaster daw. Sabi naman, Julian, ayan, drama to invoke uh, emotion. All right, sige. Next, number eight. All right, next. Nurses in diapers. General Santos Hospital workers look for jobless, for jobs elsewhere. Nurses in diapers. General Santos Hospital workers look for jobs elsewhere. What is the answer? What do you think? Progress? Should it be progress? Balikan natin, may question mark kasi. Kapag progress, demonstrate human innovation eh. Positive interaction or willingness to meet challenge presented. Hindi siya progress. Kapag consequences, consequence hindi din. It relates a group or organization to an existing news event. Usually describing how it's being affected by a previous announcement or occurrence. Okay. Human interest relates the story to social issues or discusses a person discusses a person in an emotional way as to generate interest or empathy in the readers. Okay, so that could be All right, so that could be human interest. All right, next. Question number 10. I will not provide options for the next four questions. Okay. I want you to type your answer in the chat box. What do you call an act of public and malicious imputation of an event tending to cause the dishonor, discredit, or contempt of a natural or a jurisdictional person through false publication by writing, printing, picture or effigy. What do you call an act of public and malicious imputation of an event tending to cause the dishonor, discredit or contempt of a natural or juridical person through false publication or write in by writing, printing, picture or effigy. Yeah. Okay, what's your answer? 
uh, Sir David Salazar, Jose, answered Libel. Is Libel the correct answer? Yes, it is. Yeah, Libel. The others would answer defamation. Okay, ano bang difference ng defamation? Pag libel kasi it's in writing. Pag uh, defamation, it could be in uh, it could be in speaking or in writing. So next, number 11, uh, trivia. Parts of the opening program school's press conference is the recital of the journalist creed, which was written by a noble individual named What's the name of the person who wrote the journalist script? Kasi pag mga press conferences ng school, yun ba? School division press conference, regional, national press conferences na inatenda ng mga students natin. Okay. At the opening ceremonies, they are going to recite the journalist script. The question is, who is the author of the journalist script? Body. A clue. Ang initial niya ay hindi. A specific person. Ang initial niya ay WW. W. Ayan. Galing. Alam niyo talaga yung ano? Ayan. Ang galing nila Sir Ronald. Ayan. Stock knowledge yan Sir Ronald. Napag-aralan talaga dati. Sir Ronald. Yes, you're right. Correct answer is Walter Williams. Okay, Walter Williams. Okay, let's uh, read about it. Um, readable ba? Readable ba? Sa screen ninyo? Yung journalist creed? Um, Ma'am Gian Altarejos, could you please read the first four or five uh, five paragraphs of journalist screen. From good, evening. good evening. Hi, po. Good evening. Sorry, uh, sorry po, uh, Doc, kasi phone po yung gamit ko, so masyadong maliit po. Masyado nang maliit. Po. Okay. Opo. Sino ang gumagamit ng laptop screen? O ng laptop? So you will be reading from the laptop screen. Medyo malaki. Meron ba? Miss Marianne Lou de la Cruz. For every for everybody's familiarity. Okay, what's the content of the journalist group? Ako na lang, sige. I believe in the profession of journalism. I believe that the public journal is a public trust. That all connected with it are to the full measure of their responsibility, trustees for the public, that acceptance of a lesser service than the public service is betrayal of his trust. I believe that clear thinking and clear statement, accuracy, and fairness are fundamental to good journalism. I believe that a journalist should write only what he holds in his heart to be true. I believe that the suspension of the news or suppression of the news for any consideration other than the welfare of society is indispensable. Is indispensable. I believe that no one should write as a journalist what he would not say as a gentleman. That bribery by one's own pocketbook is as much as to be avoided as bribery by the pocketbook of another that individual responsibility may not be escaped by pleading another's instructions as or another's dividends. Okay, the journalist creed is a personal and professional affirmation and code of journalism ethics written by Walter Williams in 1914. The creed has been published in more than 100 languages. Okay, next, number 12. He or she is a member of the editorial staff who is in charge of checking the copy of each story to make it free from typographical, factual, grammatical, and other possible types of error. Who is in charge to do that? Check the copy of each story. 
to make it free from typographical, factual, grammatical, and other possible types of errors. An idea? Editor. Kaso marami tayong klase ng editor eh. Anong tawag natin sa editor na yon? Anong tawag natin sa editor na yon? Typesetter. Copy reader. Okay. Anong tawag natin doon? The correct answer is editor-in-chief. Masyado na malaki scope ng editor-in-chief eh. This, this one has a very specific function. Check the copy from typographical, factual, grammatical, and other possible types of error. The correct answer is copy editor. Okay. Ano bang difference ng copy editor at proofreader. The copy editor's work is to ensure that the document meets all the conventions of a good writing. In addition to this, a copy editor sees to it that the writing complies with the conventions of grammar, proper and correct vocabulary, and the text contains correctly placed appropriate punctuation marks. So the copy editor uh, checks for all possible errors. Error in structure sa news writing, error din sa um, error din sa grammar, sa vocabulary, sa punctuation marks, all in all. How about the proofreader? It's assigned to check or side of checking reproduction as to what the final documented text would look like. The task is not about making revision, but making a correction. Thus, it can be said that it is making sure of the total absence of any typographical mistakes from the manuscript and to proceed to the production stage. The element of correction may range from a letter to a paragraph or any accidentally omitted or repeated information or misplaced database. Uh, based on those two paragraphs, in your own understanding, anong difference ng copy editor from a proofreader? Is in your own understanding. Anong difference sa function ng copy editor at ng um, proofreader? A reviewer. Sino ang reviewer? Sin ang reviewer? Anong difference? Between the two, mas malaki yung scope ng task ni copy editor. Okay. Ang isang, ang, ang work ni proofreader, mag-start lang kapag dumaan na kay copy editor. That means yung pinuproofread ni proofreader ay na-edit na ng copy editor. And a copy editor could do his or her work sa soft copy ng, ng report. So, pwede yan, um, pwede yan na gagawin niya mag-edit siya soft copy pa lang noong no, no news report. Pero, pwede, and then, uh, the copy editor can make major revisions. Pwede uh, revamp talaga or change sa, sa buong paragraph. Pero si proofreader, very limited na lang or uh, konti na lang ang kailangan, ninyo, kailangan niyang i-check because dumaan na siya kay copy editor. And the proofreader, hindi siya nag-check uh, nag ng soft copy. Ipiniprint out talaga. So that would be the final phase of checking. The so proofreader would be more after yung, yung sa layout, yung sa typographical errors. So, ayan. Kung may mga na-omit na word or letter. So, ganon. Mas mabigat ang responsibility ni copy editor as compared to the proofreader. Okay. The proofreader's work begins once nagawa na ng copy editor yung work niya. Alright, next. 
uh, from campus journalism, let's Ang proceed. Ang hinalag ng head sa headphone. Love, may, di ba may headphone ka? Pero ako na headphone mo, love. Ang hina. Ito? Okay. Um, for number 13, from campus journalism, we'll be moving forward to different uh, literary terminologies. Number 13, a statement which can contain two or more meanings. Letter A, ambiguity. Letter A, a letter B, anecdote. Letter C, epigraph. Or letter D, and letter D, foil. What do you call a statement which can contain two or more meanings? Ambiguity, B, anecdote, C, epigraph, or letter D, foil. Tapos na tayo sa campus term. Literary terminologies naman. The correct answer is, yes, letter A, ambiguity. Yeah, di ba pa sinasabi natin, um, it should be unambiguous. Dapat hindi siya double meaning. It should only uh, contain or one clear or definite meaning. So ambiguity. How about an epigraph? What is an epigraph? It is a short quotation or saying at the beginning of a book or chapter intended to suggest its theme. Diba? In, in reading novels, uh, in reading novels, yung first page ng chapter, mayroong quotation, a short, uh, a short quotation that would, uh, that would say or encapsulate the content of the whole chapter. And that quotation okay, in the beginning of the chapter is what we call as an epigraph. Okay, next. An anecdote is a short and interesting story about a specific incident, person, or place. When we say interesting, it does not necessarily mean funny. The anecdote should be uh, should help define and support the angle you are talking. So if you're invited, for example, as a speaker, and you want to uh, elaborate or elaborate on your, on your key points, or if you want to call the attention, of your listeners okay, or attract the attention of your li listeners by telling them a relatable story, then uh, we are, that story is considered as an, an anecdote. Okay, the anecdote could not be about the place or maybe could be about the place or maybe even someone who works there. The anecdote can be based on your own experience or that of someone else. Okay, anecdote. Next, foil. Ang foil naman, has something to do in character uh, in characterization. So it's more on uh, narratives, a character who contrasts with another character, usually the protagonist, in order to highlight the personality of the other character. A foil either differs drastically or it's extremely similar, but with a key difference setting them apart. For example, sa Batman, si Joker, is unethical and enjoys chaos and disorder, which is a foil or the opposite of the character of Batman, who is ethical and upholds justice and order. So a foil is a type of character in a narrative. Okay, let's proceed to question number 14. The emotional content of a word. Letter A, connotation. Letter B, figurative language, letter C, denotation, or letter D, epic. What do you call the emotional content of a word? Connotation, figurative language, denotation, or letter D, epic. The emotional content of a word is Yes, connotation yon. Okay, that's the opposite of denotation. Pag sinabi natin connotative uh, meaning, that is one's personal uh, definition or perception of the word. Okay? And when we say denotation, it's the meaning provided by the dictionary or its literal meaning. Number 15. 
a mild word or phrase which substitutes for another which would be undesirable because of its too direct and pleasant because it is too direct and pleasant or offensive. What do we call that? Euphemism, letter B, genre, letter C, point of view, or letter D, picturesque novel. Again, a, wild, a mild word or phrase which substitutes for another, which would be undesirable because of its because it is too direct, unpleasant, or offensive. Euphemism, genre, point of view, or picaresque novel. The third answer is letter letter A, euphemism. Ano ba mga euphemism na yan? Can you give me an example of of euphemism? Instead of saying special child, we use uh, children with special needs. Ano pa? Instead of saying cripple or disabled, we opt to use the word differently able. Can you give me other examples of euphemism? You are you are like a tiger. That's more like a simile. Simile siya yun. Ano yung mga euphemism? Yung mga words na pinapalitan natin ng ibang terminology. Kasi masyado siyang direct, unpleasant, or offensive. Ah, di ba? Minsan, instead of saying janitor, we call them as auxiliary staff or sanitary personnel. Yung mga tagalinas, we call them sanitary personnel. Or instead of saying squatters, ano yung euphemism natin sa squatters? What better term do we use instead of saying squatters? Ano? Informal settler, correct. Ano pa? Can you give me other examples of euphemism? Madami yan eh. Instead of saying fat, we use what term? Instead of saying fat. Ayon. Instead of saying fat, we say plus size, di ba? Instead of saying poor, less fortunate. Marami yun. Ano pa? Instead of saying died, we say pass away. Ayan. Disabled, ayan. PWD, persons with disability. Okay. What else? Can you give me other examples of euphemisms? Ano pa yung mga ginagamitan natin ng mga euphemisms? Deaf, ayan, hearing impaired. Okay, yun, those are euphemisms. A mild word or phrase to substitute, ayan, janitor, maintenance inside, or sanitary personnel. Okay, sanitary officer. Okay, next. Ano naman yung point of view? The point of view is the angle from which a story is told. And we use this terminology in narratives. Narratives could be written in different point of view. It could be written in the first person point of view, second person point of view, third person point of view, and third person limited or third person omniscient. When we say first person uh, point of view, that means the story is told in the point of view of one of the characters. And commonly, it's told in the point of view of the main character, yung nagsasalita, yung nagnanarate ng story. An indication that a story is written in the first person point of view is the use of uh, first person pronouns, okay? personal pronouns like I, okay, we, and so first person point of view. Yun. Second person point of view, on the other hand, is not commonly used in, in narratives, in stories. So, Kasi you, meaning you are directly addressing the reader. Hindi siya ginagamit uh, halo sa narrative. 
Pag sinabi natin third person point of view, that could be of two kinds. The third person limited or the third person omniscient. The third person limited point of view, okay, meaning that the narrator is outside of the story. So the narrator is not one of the characters, but the narrator only exposes the thoughts, the feelings of one character. So um, it's like the camera eye technique. Yung sabi niya, ninanarate lang niya kung ano yung nakikita niya nangyari sa mga characters ng story. Pero nasa, nasa labas siya ng story. When we say third person omniscient, the word omniscient means all-knowing. So hindi ito camera eye technique because the narrator can expose okay, or um, tell about everything about the characters including their their feelings uh, uh what's in what's in the head of the characters na sasabi niya kaya tinatawag natin na third person omniscient okay ang difference kapag omniscient no biases or preferences okay kapag limited he only knows what is going on inside the heart and mind of one person. So the omniscient uh, point of view has full knowledge of all characters and situations, while the limited third-person point of view has a limited perspective. Okay, kaya nga camera ay technique lang. Next, ano naman yung picaresque? A picaresque novel from the Spanish picaresca. Okay, or uh, picaro or rube or rascal is a popular subgenre of prose fiction which is usually satirical and depicts in, rea in realistic and often humorous detail and adventures of a roguish uh, hero or low social class who lives by his or her wits in a corrupt society. Yung story ni Tom Sawyer, ni Tom Sawyer, ni Huckleberry Finn. Okay, yun ang mga examples ng mga picaresque novel. Tayong, uh, tayong uh, Filipinos, we also have our local versions of picaresque novel, like yung mga story ni Juan Tamad, ni Pedro Penduco, ganyan. So, mga picaresque yun. Next, what do you call the use of angry and insulting language? Sa literature. Or for example, um, sa... Ganyan. Sa mga play, magaling dito si William Shakespeare din. Sa mga plays niya, pag galit yung character, uh, the character would make use of angry and insulting language. Okay. Is it a jargon, invective, malapropism, or mood? Jargon, invective, Malapropism mode. The correct answer is I know typographical though. The correct answer is invective. Disha malapropism. I'll explain malapropism later. A uh, euphemism. Is the use of inoffensive term instead of an offensive one that may be rude or harsh? Yung inexplain natin kanina. Ang opposite niya is what we call as invective. It is the use of abusive language towards someone. For example, sa play na Hamlet, how Hamlet blames Gertrude for marrying Claudius, Gertrude, uh, his own mother, for marrying his uncle. Okay. Uh, who, uh, Gertrude who connived with Claudius to kill the father of Hamlet, the killer of Hamlet the killer of King Hamlet. He verbally abuses her. So another example is Robinson constantly verbally and mentally abusing himself over being trapped on the, the island. Okay. So invective, use of abusive language, which is the opposite of euphemism, the use of mild, uh, inoffensive language. Okay. Ang malaprofism naman is the confusion of similar sounding words resulting in nonsensical phrase. For example, I'm tired of everybody talking, taking me for granted. Okay, this is um, this is unintentional. Instead of saying for granted, na mali. Ang nasabi na word ay something that is close to it, but a lot different in, in meaning. Something that is close in pronunciation, but a lot different in meaning. Um, 
this is one best example of this is uh, Melanie Marquez. Di ba si Melanie Marquez? Madalas siyang uh, maging ay dito, controversial because of her malaptopism, yung melanism na sinasabi nila. For example, sabi niya na uh, full blast. She mistakenly said uh, full blast. Uh, full blush instead of full blast. Ano ba? Yung kapag nagsasalita tayo, uh, namamali tayo ng use the word or terminology and as a result, nagiging humorous ang effect niya. So, ayan, my, ayan migraine. Okay, Instead of saying migraine, nasasabi natin may migraine ako eh. Oh, ayan, malaprofesan yon. Ano pa ba? Anong mga example niyan eh. Yung nagagamit natin sa mga conversation kasi magkatunog halos pero malayo ang ibig sabihin. Okay. So ang effect nakakatawa. Can you give me other examples? Wala na. Mind brain. Ayan. Sige. Malaprobism yun. Next. Why saying proverb, short memorable saying that expresses a truth and is handed down from one generation to the next? What do we call that? Aphorism, analogy, adage, or aside? A why saying, a proverb, a short memorable saying that expresses a truth and is handed down from one generation to the next? Is it aphorism, analogy, adage, or a side, a side. A wise saying, proverb, short, memorable saying that expresses a truth and is handed down from one generation to the next. The correct answer is adage, okay, an adage. Okay, let us differentiate adage from aphorism. An aphorism is a concise observation which contains a general truth, while an adage is a traditional saying conveying a common experience or observation. Um, pareho naman silang parang saying, but an aphorism is not as old as an adage. Unlike an adage, kasi it's handed down from one generation to another. Ang aphorism, my known creator. So, hindi anonymous yung, ay yung source niya, yung nagsabi nun. It has a known creator. While an adage naman does not have a known creator, usually it's anonymous because it's handed down from one general generation to another through word of mouth. Okay, nagpasa-pasa na siya mga kasabihan. Yun yung difference ng aphorism at adage. Ang adage, mas luma, mas matagal na na ginagamit kesa sa aphorism. At ang adage, walang creator. While um, sa aphorism, tukoy kung sino yung nagsabi nun. Okay? Or kung kanina nagsimula yun. Okay. Um, yung kanina, yung aside. Aside is um, definitely just a distractor. Malayo siya dun sa correct answer because it's a, it's a term in drama, a dramatic uh, speech. Okay? Uh, dialogue, pag sinabi natin dialogue, it's the conversation between characters. So yung exchanges ng mga characters. Pag sinabi naman natin soliloquy, it's a long speech in which the character usually alone, well, the character is usually alone on stage, speaks to himself or herself, unheard by any characters. Pag, pag soliloquy, parang one act lang, uh, para siyang ano, uh, para siyang monologue. Okay? So the character speaks to to himself to himself or herself. Kasi sa monologue naman kasi, parang nagpukwento siya. May kinakausap siya. Pero pag soliloquy naman, kinakausap lang ng character sa play, yung sarili niya. And although, naka, although voice yung pakikipag-usap niya sa sarili niya, parang hindi siya naririnig ng ibang mga characters sa story. Pag aside naman, it's a remark a character makes usually to the audience that is not heard by other characters on stage. May mga technique na ganyan, especially sa 
sa sa mga classical dramas, yung mga characters would directly address okay, the audience, pero hindi naririnig kunyari ng mga other characters yung mga sinasabi niya, yung mga nire-reveal niya sa audience. Okay. A monologue, a long speech by one character, usually heard by other characters. Okay. Pag kunyari ang isang, isang um, character na deliver ng speech, mahabang speech, addressing other characters in in the play. So that's a monologue. Okay. So those are the different dramatic speeches. Dialogue, soliloquy, aside, and, and monologue. Okay. Number 17. A purification of emotions in literature or art is called A. Catharsis. B. Colloquialism. C. Vernacular. D. Verisimilitude. Again, what do you call a purification of emotions in literature or art? A. Catharsis. B. Colloquialism. C. Vernacular. D. Very similitude. Purification of emotions. The correct answer is yeah, catharsis. Let's talk about the other options. Okay. Uh, catharsis muna. In the literature and art, a purification of emotions. The Greek philosopher Aristotle is the originator of this term. He used the term to describe the effect on an audience of a tragedy acted out on a theater stage. This effect consists of cleansing the audience of disturbing emotions such as fear and pity, thereby releasing attention. So catharsis, how about verisimilitude? In a literary work or film, verisimilitude is slightness to the truth, resemblance of a, fic a fictitious word to a real event, even if it is far fetched, a far fetched one. Very similitude ensures that even a fantasy must be rooted in reality, which means that events should be plausible to the extent that readers and viewers consider them credible enough to be able to relate them somehow to their experiences of real life. So, in very similitude in movies okay, or in and let's say novels, kahit na siya non-fiction, kahit hindi siya totoo, kahit na mga characters niya, uh, let's say, ang characters, nagsasalita, out of this world yung theme, parang alam na natin na fruit of imagination, to make it still relatable to the audience, ito yung technique na ginagawa ng author. Okay, it, it ensures that a fantasy is still relatable or connected to reality. Usually, ang technique na ginagawa nila, they would make use of yung, ano, yung mga, yung mga re common words, yung, hindi, yung ano ba, realistic na mga dialogues, kahit na unrealistic yung scene. Okay. Next, number 18. A word or phrase preceding or following a name which serves to describe the character in literature. A. Is that Hamarsha? B. Hubris? C, epigraph, na, describe, na, uh, na define na natin kanina yung epigraph. Letter D, epithet. A word or phrase preceding or following a name which serves to describe the character in literature. Is it the hamarsha, ugris, epigraph, or epithet? The correct answer is letter, let's see, correct answer, yes, it's epithet. Okay, any epithet, it could be an adjective or adject, adjectival phrase to characterize a person, thing, attribute, or quality. The use of a qualifying word or phrase to further describe something. For example, Marvin the Martian, ayun, Ivan the Terrible, the artist formerly known as Prince, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Can you give me other examples of epithet? Magbigay niya kayo na ibang mga titles, 
uh, na may uh, epithet. Alexander the Great. Ayan. What else? Ano pa? Alexander the Great. Mani. Pakya, uh, Pacman, Pacquiao. Dora the Explorer. Correct. Ayan, mga epithet yan. So, ano naman yung Hamar siya in you, please? Okay, those are the characteristics of a tragic hero. Number one, yung Hamar siya, dapat daw, ang tragic hero has a tragic flaw that causes the downfall of a hero. For example, sa, uh, sa Iliad, okay, si Achilles, he has a tragic flaw. Ano yun? Yung Achilles heel, yung weakness niya, that would cause his death or that would cause his downfall. Ano naman yung new Michael, ja uh, Michael Jackson, King of Pop? Okay. Ano naman yung new breeze? Excessive pride and disrespect for the natural order of things. Uh, for example, um, si... Okay, for example, si, yung character, si Macbeth, yung greed niya, okay, yung too much ambition niya, yung naging downfall niya. Number three, peripithia is the reversal of fate that a hero experiences. Anagorizes is the moment in time when the hero makes an important discovery in a story, usually yung as a climax. Okay, merong, merong i-reveal. Re na important detail, okay, yung turning point ng story, okay, may madidiscover yung main character. Anag, anagnorizes daw yun. And that would cause the, uh, the downfall of the tragic hero. Ayan, Oedipus Rex. Ayan. Okay, nemesis, nemesis, a punishment that the protagonist cannot avoid, usually occurring as a result of their hubris, catharsis, feelings of pity and fear, felt by the audience for the inevitable downfall of the protagonist. Ayan. Nakita ninyo, um, yung mga options na pinuprovide sa examination, minsan akala natin ang, um, ang lalape or ang hirap mamili, but uh, usually they are taken from different, uh, different fields or uh, different topics. Kaya dapat meron talagang familiarity kung saan Saan ba yung term na to? Saan ba ito ginagamit? Saan ba siya pumapasok? Next, number 19. Uh, literary criticism. In literature, an extreme form of realism that developed in France in the 19th century is called A. Naturalism B. Malapropism C. Modernism or letter D. Postmodernism Number 19. In literature, an extreme form of realism that developed in France in the 19th century is called naturalism, malapropism, C, modernism, and D, postmodernism. So tatanggalin na natin yung malapropism kasi alam naman natin kung ano na yung definition niya. Hindi siya literary criticism. The correct answer for this is modernism. Okay, bakit modernism? Let us differentiate muna yung realism at naturalism in literary criticism. Realism is a literary movement characterized by the representation of real life or a realism. Okay, it is portrayed or it portrayed the everyday life of ordinary people. It depicts the middle class characters, yung mga commoners. Okay, and Realistic novels use themes like society, social class, mobility, and the like. Pag naman naturalism, this is an outgrowth of literary realism influenced by scientific theories. A naturalism portrayed how environment, heredity, and social conditions control human beings. It depicts yung lower classes. Pag naturalism, okay, a lower class, ang din ang ang pinifeature niya sa work. Kapag naman realism, yung middle class. Okay, naturalistic novels were written on themes of violence, 
poverty, corruption, prostitution, prostitution, or most likely, yung mga dark side, okay, or unpleasant uh, side of, of life. Ayan. Okay, let me just admit, Miss Elsie. Ayan. Wait. Okay. So, modernism versus postmodernism, what's the difference? Modernism was prevalent from the 19th century and early to uh, 20th century style. It was influenced by the First World War. It was based on using rational and logical means to gain knowledge since it rejected realism. Modernism rejected the conventional styles of prose and poetry. Pag sinabi naman natin postmodernism, it was prevalent from the mid 20th century. It is influ influenced by the Second World War. Yung modernism influenced by the First World War, postmodernism influenced by the Second World War. So postmodernism was based on unscientific, irrational thought process, and it rejected logical thinking. Modernism rejected uh, realism, while uh, postmodernism rejected logical thinking. So postmodernism deliberately uses a mixture of conventional styles. Next, question number 20. This has something to do with um, stylistics and discourse or discourse analysis. Number 20, which maxim of the cooperative principle are being violated in the following dialogues? Indicate which conversational implicatures this leads to. Okay, sabi ng, ng speaker A, Mrs. Johnson is an old witch. And speaker B answers, or uh, person B answers, it's, wonder, it's a wonderful weather for this time of year, don't you think? Anong maxim of cooperative principle ang na-violate doon? Is it the maxim of quantity, maxim of quality, maxim of relation, or maxim of manner? The first person says, Mrs. Johnson is an old witch. Ang response, it's a wonderful weather for this time of year, don't you think? What is violated? Maxim of quantity, maxim of quality, maxim of relation, or letter D, maxim of manner? Answer. Um, I'm just wondering, hindi kayo masyado, yung mga nasa Zoom, hindi masyado yung mga answers. Anong ibig sabihin nun? Medyo nakalimutan na yung mga lessons sa to. Mahirap yung items. Miss Glory from Bohol answered letter C. And that's the right answer. Oh yeah, na-forgot na karamihan. Ayan. Ito yung mga tinuro sa atin sa, sa mga major subjects. And um, ito yung po-cover pag, pag, ano na, pag major ship na yung exam. During our Gen Ed review, diba, hindi naman puro surface level lang yung mga principles, yung mga kinocover natin doon. But since this is for major ship, we have to dig deeper into, into the, to English as a language. And this one has something to do with discourse analysis. Ina-analyze natin how people communicate. So ito, it's a violation of maxim of relation. Ano ba yung maxim of relation? Okay. Let's go back to Grice's conversational maxim. maxims. According to Grice, okay, um, itong cooperative principle that we call are, are founded on the belief that people who engage in meaningful conversation must have the following. Okay, it should meet the maxim of quantity, quality, manner, and relevance. According to Grice's conversational maxim, lahat daw ng tao na nag engage sa isang usapan, sa isang conversation, may isang goal. And that is to become accurate, correct, okay, relevant, and um, what else? And relevant. Okay. Ano yung ibig sabihin na itong quantity? Ang isang conversation daw follows the maximum of quantity 
if the speaker says no less than the conversation requires. Say no more than what the conversation requires. So for example, ito muna, uh, quantity. Kung ano yung tanong, dapat daw ang sagot natin hindi kulang at hindi sobra. That's how that's how effective communication takes place. So the maximum quantity states that make your contribution as informative as is required and do not make your contribution more informative than it is required. For example, in a conversation, does S. Plett have any siblings? Tinatanong lang kung may kapatid. Yes, she has a sister. This is a violation of maximum of quantity. Why? When hearing B's response, A assumes that B is fully answering the question, and that is, B is being as informative as possible. So A would naturally assume that S. Plett has exactly one sister and doesn't have any any brothers. So pag tinanong kasi, um, may mga kapatid ba siya? Ang sagot ay, ah, oo, meron siyang kapatid na, na babae. Bakit yun violation of maximum public? It gives an impression na yun lang ang kapatid niya, babae. Wala na siyang kapatid na, na lalaki. Okay. Ano pa yung maximum of, okay, let's go back. Maximum of quality. The maximum of quality says that do not say what you believe to be false. Do not say that what, do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence. Okay, how do we, how do we violate this maxim? Kailangan daw in a conversation, wag tayo magsasalita ng hindi totoo. Or do not talk about things that you are not knowledgeable enough. Okay, so pag hindi ka mas sure sa mga sinasabi mo or hindi mo masyadong alam yung isang, isang bagay, then you shouldn't be talking about it. Uh, for example, in some ways, the first of these points is the most basic max maxim for the cooperative principle. Communicating in good faith seems to require that we are or at least try to be truthful. So kapag ang tao nagsisinungaling, then that is a violation of the maxim of quality. Okay. Or kapag nagsasalita ka ng mga bagay na hindi ka naman sigurado, that's still a vi uh, violation of the maximum of quality. Pag sinabi nating violation, it has to be unintentional. Uh, intentional. Okay. So, or, or intentional. Intentionally saying things that are untrue or, um, or else saying things that you don't have enough evidence for. So, kapag violation, sinasadya. Kapag flouting, it's, it's involving irony or sarcasm. Hindi ka naman talaga nagsisinungaling. You are just, sinasadya mo lang talaga yon for the purpose of being sarcastic or being ironic. For example, when a child asks for the 20th time, are we there yet? Okay. Nakulitan ka na sa bata, tanong ng tanong, are we there yet? Nandun na ba, nakarating na ba tayo? So the parent, fed up, okay, would answer, Nope, we're just going to keep driving in this car for the rest of our lives. Ayan. Hindi, hindi na tayo makakarating doon. Magdadrive na lang tayo magdadrive habang buhay. So, hindi naman totoo yun. That's just flouting. But, um, intentionally, sinabi yon because naiinis na or we just want to be sarcastic. So that's flouting the maxim of quality. How about the maxim of manner? Ang maxim of manner is violated Kapag hindi tayo nagiging brief, orderly, or uh, pag hindi clear ang pagkakadeliver natin sa, sa, sa mga utterances natin. For example, um, you have to avoid obscure obscurity of expression. This relates not to the content of what you say, but how you express yourself. Sa maximum quality kasi, it's, it's after the content, kung gano'ng katutful yung content natin. Yung maximum of relevance, kung, uh, kung connected ba yung sinasabi natin sa pinag-uusapan. Pero sa maximum of manner, it's more on the delivery. And a perfect example niyan, ito, di ba? Si Kim Chu uh, was very controversial for, for always violating this maxim, yung maximum of manner. So sometimes, sa kagustuhan niya explain yung isang bagay, she tend to beat around the bush or hindi niya na-express yung thought niya with clarity. Uh, yung controversial na bawal lumabas, she was trying to explain about the ABS-CBN shutdown, that there was no violation naman, ganyan. But then, 
kung saan napun, napunta yung statement niya. So, that's a violation of the maximum of manner. Okay. Tapos, um, nakamove on naman na si Kim Chudo, di ba? She recorded niya her, her own song na Bawal Lumabas. Kaso, when she explained it, okay, ganito niya in-explain. Ano daw nangyari yun? Uh, ano daw yung natutunan niya sa experience na yun? Okay. Sabi niya, para akong nabuhayan na 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 tayo tayo ko yung nakatayo para siyang umikot na 360 360 yon pa, pa, pa ikot ikot yung statement niya na hindi niya na express kung ano talaga yung thought niya so that's a violation of the maxim of manner okay so let's try to apply kapag maxim of quantity it says uh, kailangan it has to be uh, kailangan truthful tama yung information na pinuprovide natin. Pag maximum of manner, you should deliver it with clarity. Okay? Pag sinabing maximum of relevance, dapat ang sagot mo or ang respond mo, ang response mo ay connected okay? or hindi out of line. Pag maximum of, ayun, of quantity, ang sagot mo no more, no less. Okay. So number 21, it was Anna's first job interview. She was so nervous that she did she did a lot of bitting around the bush to explain her point to the interviewer who gave her a perplexed look. Evaluate the situation with reference to the cooperative principle. Okay. How are you going to evaluate it? Anna violated the maxim of quantity. Anna violated the maxim of manner. Anna flouted the maxim of relevance. Anna flouted the maxim of quality. Kapag flouted, sinadya. It was Anna's first job interview. She was so nervous that she did, uh, she did a lot of bidding around the bush to explain her point to the interviewer who gave her a perplexed look. So is it a violation of the maximum of quantity? Ma violation of the maximum of manner? Flouting of the maxim of relevance or flouting of the maxim of quality? What's the correct answer? That is letter A, uh, letter B, a violation of the maxim of manner. Kasi hindi niya na-deliver yung response niya or sabot niya to the interviewer. Okay, next, let's proceed to um, logical fallacies. Under pa din to na discourse analysis. What is the fallacy of drawing a larger conclusion than the evidence supports? For example, all Robin have red breasts. Men don't cry. Letter A, hasty generalization. Letter B, ad ignorantium. Letter B, ad hominem. Or letter D, bandwagon. What is this fallacy? Pag sinabi natin logical fallacy, these are what lapses or mistakes in reasoning. In a conversation kasi, when we exchange rebuttals, when we exchange arguments, minsan ang galing-galing ng delivery ng mga ng tao. When, when a person responds to a debate or an argument with conviction, pero if you will try to analyze yung thought, Okay, out of line pala, illogical pala yung, yung sagot o yung response. So these logical fallacies will, uh, will help us in order to analyze uh, other people's arguments. In this way, we will also make sound arguments para hindi tayo out of line, para logical lagi um, ang pakikipag-usap natin or pag, um, paki ang response natin sa, sa mga kausap natin. Okay. So, anong klaseng fallacy yon? The correct answer is hasty generalization. So, you draw conclusion than the evidence supports. Nilalahat mo, okay? Parang you speak for all when you do not have enough sample or enough evidence. So, that's hasty generalization. So, let's review that. Kasi most likely may matatanong sa exam about logical fallacies. So, again, a fallacy is an error of reasoning. These are flawed statements that often sound true. Yung parang ang ganda pakinggan, or parang totoo naman. But if you will try to analyze, it's 
um, a faulty reasoning. Okay, logical fallacies are often used to strengthen an argument, but if the reader detects that the argument uh, can backfire and damage and damage the writer's credibility. So we will become more effective communicator and critical listener if we are knowledgeable about these logical fallacies. Ano ano ba yon? Number one, the bandwagon approach. Ano yung bandwagon approach? So it must be cool because everybody is doing it. So yung argument na if everyone is doing it, then okay lang yon. So that's a bandwagon. For example, 90% of computer users choose Macs. Okay? So it's also called as appeal to popularity. Kapag ginagawa ng lahat, yun yung okay na gawin. So that's bandwagon approach or appeal to uh, popularity. What about slippery slope? A fallacious argument built on the supposition that a small step would lead to a larger chain of events. For example, if you don't stop smoking, then you are going to start uh, shooting heroin, okay? Or marijuana is a gateway to drugs. Parang, um, parang ganun. O oh, ayan, nakipag-boyfriend ka na, mabubuntis ka na niyan. So parang uh, papunta na agad doon. Can you give me other examples of arguments na narinig natin na slippery slope? Yung parang hindi pa man din, pinapapunta na doon yung uh, yung sitwasyon o yung argument. At dyan, nagsisimula yan. Ma maninigarilyo, tapos susunod yan, magmamariwana na, susunod, magsasabu na yan. Ganon. Slippery slope yon. Can you give me other examples na, ano, na madalas nating marinig? But if you will try to, uh, to analyze, it's fallacious. Answered pa kayo. People here in Zoom, you can turn on your microphone. Can you think of an example? Yung ganong a slippery slope. A small step would lead to a larger chain of events. Ayan, kaka cellphone mo yan. Ayan, kaka cellphone mo yan. Okay, ayan, sa cellphone, cellphone ka. Mabubulag ka yan. Ayan. Uh, ganon. Smaller events leading to... Okay. Next, I'm just admit. Okay, next. False authority. Using a celebrity or authority figure's name to support an issue which is not really his or her expertise. For example, Katy Perry thinks that the killer should be pardoned. Okay. You are talking about justice, okay? Pero ang sinight mo na authority si Katy Perry. Who is Katy Perry? She is a popular uh, singer, a pop star. Okay? Although she's popular, hindi naman niya, linya, yung, uh, you, uh, wait. hindi naman niya, linya, yung part na yon, or yung argument na yon. So that's false authority. You are using a name of a celebrity or authoritative figure to support an issue which is not really his or her expertise. Next, hasty generalization. It's a type of inducting reasoning in conclusions made through insufficient evidence. Pag nag-generalize ka, for example, the last two mass murderers were from Michigan. Obviously, the people from Michigan are dangerous. Or you, you know, ganun tayo. Um, Dalawa lang. Ang daming taga Michigan. Dalawa yung gumawa ng krimen. So, di lahat mo na. Okay? Ang mga taga Michigan talaga mamamatay tao. You know? okay. Can you give me other examples of uh, hasty generalization? Anybody? As a Facebook. Can you give me an example of hasty generalization? You make generalization out of insufficient evidence. Yes, parang stereotyping, correct. Tag ayon, tagatundo kasi, ano, tagatundo kasi yan, ako, ingat ka. 
Okay, parang you generalize na lahat ng taga-tundo. Okay? What else? Ano yun? Okay. Yeah, parang stereotyping. Okay. What about this one? Begging the question. A is true because A is true. Chocolate is healthy because it is good for you. Parang yung begging the question, pinapaikot-ikot mo lang yung argument. But you are not stating as a reason to support the argument or evidence to support your argument. Ito yung mga paikot-ikot lang yung sinasabi. Pero wala naman talaga, uh, wala naman talaga sila. Parang walang supporting evidence or wala talagang uh, laman yung argument nila. Okay. Number six is straw man, a fallacy of destruction and irrelevant conclusion. For example, how could you possibly cheat on his taxes? He's such a great father. Diba? Ang layo. Iniiba yung usapan. Okay? Idinadivert yung, yung topic. So, how could he possibly cheat on his taxes? His work. It has nothing to do with him being a father. So, hindi na divert yung attention ng listener. That's straw man. And Mr. Corrigan is appeal to pity. Ayan. People living in Mindanao, mga NPA yan. Ano po yun? Uh, abo, the great. Pag ganun, that is hasty generalization. Okay. Ano pa? Um, Ad misericordiam, appeal to pity. When you are appealing to someone's emotion in order to distract them from the truth, for example, you are applying for a job and you are asked about your credentials and uh, and you would answer, I, I badly need this job. Okay? My father is sick and I'm the breadwinner of the family. Ganyan. So that is appeal to uh, to PT, ad misericordia. Okay, next, we have ad hominem. A very familiar tayo sa ad hominem. Personal attack. Okay, instead of responding with a sound argument, you attack your uh, opponent personally. For example, how could Mary know anything about cars? She's a woman. So, minaliit yung pagiging, yung pagiging babae. Or, for example, sa, sa social media, may mga debate. Ayan, nagko-comment sa chat. Nagko-comment sa, uh, nagre-reply sa mga comments. Tapos, kapag hindi masagot directly ang argument, ang pangit mo, o ganyan. Itsura mo, ganyan. Yung itsura na yung ano, ikaw nga dyan eh. Yung, yung mga, ayan. <laughs> ayan, so Victor, ayan. Eh, hindi ako DDS, hindi din ako dilawan. Ah, yun yung example nun. So, si Duterte to Dick Gordon. Nagagalit siya kay Dick Gordon. Magpapayat ka muna. So, ayun. Ad hominem yun. Okay. So, ito naman either or fallacy. Or false dilemma. Or false dichotomy. Parang either or. Kapag hindi mo ito ginawa, then, oh, kung ikaw, sige, halimbawa, um, you, are, you are criticizing the president. Okay, you are criticizing the president. Ay, dilawan yan. Okay, kung hindi ka DDS, sigurado dilawan ka. Hindi ganon. Parang yung either or uh, fallacy. You're either part of the solution or part of the problem. Kung hindi ka uh, tutulong dito sa ano, Kung hindi ka tutulong dito sa um, tutulong dito sa sa ginagawa namin, you're part of the problem. Okay? Or kung mananahimik ka, then uh, kung mananahimik ka, you are tolerating them. O, ganon. So parang either or fallacy. And we have this false hope. The arguer infers that because one event follows another, the event must be the cause of the second event. For example, um, the, the rooster crowd, the sun came up. Nung tumilaok yung manok, sumikat yung araw. Ibig sabihin, it's the rooster that made the sun come up. Just because one event happened after another, then yun na yung cause nung event na yun. Okay, So that's post hope. Okay, tignan ko nga if you understood yun. So, ito yung mga, yung mga, uh, yung mga ibig sabihin na, eh. ito yung mga choices niyo ah. Bandwagon, doing one thing is okay because everybody's doing it. Pag ganit, pag band, bandwagon. Slippery slope, parang one small thing could lead to another bigger thing. Okay, false authority, if you are using the name of a celebrity or a person of authority in an argument na hindi naman siya expert on. 
pag hasty generalization, you are generalizing, meaning nilalahat mo based on a limited based on limited evidences. Okay? Naloko ka minsan ng lalaki, sabi mo, maluloko naman lahat ng lalaki. That's hasty generalization. Okay? Begging the question, pinapaikot-ikot mo lang yung argument, okay? pero hindi ka talaga nagbibigay ng justification. Okay? Pag straw man, ibig sabihin, dinadivert mo yung, uh, yung conversation. Hindi mo talaga ina-address yung argument, but you are raising a different topic. Okay? Add Mr. Recordium, appeal to PT, nagpapaawa ka instead na sumasagot ka logically. Okay? What else? Okay? Um, ad hominem kapag personal attack. Okay? You attack a person uh, physical appearance or personal life instead of responding to the argument. Okay? Either or Okay, kapag hindi ka ganito, ganito ka dapat. As if there are only two possible options. And kapag, okay, kapag post hoc, I'm sorry. Ayan, ayan. <laughs> Na-reveal ko na. Alright then. So, that's it. Pag post hoc, um, just because one thing, one event happened after the other, yun na yung nagiging cause na isang event. Okay. So let's have this. Ayan, red herring. Are you next one na lang. School districts have the ability to monitor student internet use at school. Therefore, the district will eventually monitor all student internet activity. Okay. Ano kaya yon? School districts have the ability to monitor students' internet use at school. Therefore, the districts will eventually monitor all student internet activity. Is that bandwagon, slippery slope, false authority, hasty generalization, begging the question, strawman, adversary, cordon, ad hominem, either hominem, either or or post hoc? What do you think? Anong sagot? The correct answer is correct answer is kapag post hoc dahil nangyari to after nito yun na yung cause nito pag bandwagon sabi ni Miss Christine dahil ginagawa ng lahat okay yun Begging the question, pinapaikot-ikot mo lang yung argument. School districts have the ability to monitor students' internet use at school. O kaya pala ng mga school, i-monitor yung internet usage ng mga estudyante. Halaunan yan, the district will eventually monitor all students' internet activity. Ano yun? Slipper, correct, Juliet. It's slippery slope. Okay. Slippery slope. One small event, sinabi mo na na yun na ay maglilip to another big event. That's slippery slope. Okay. Next. All right. Next, number two. Even though it is only the first day of school, I can already tell I'm going to hate this year. Even though it is only the first day of school, I can already tell I'm going to hate this year. What's the answer? Even though it is only the first day of school, I can already tell I'm going to hate this year. Anong logical fallacy yun? Galing. What's the correct answer? First day of school pa lang, alam ko na, this is going to be a bad school year. I'm going to hate this school year. That is hasty, hasty generalization na yon. You are making a generalization based on insufficient evidence. You don't have enough evidence to say that it's going to be a bad school year. 
but you have this conclusion or generalization right away. So that's a hasty generalization. Okay. Next. The stoplight always turns red right before I reach the intersection. Therefore, my car must be the reason why the stoplight always changes. The stoplight always turns red before I reach the intersection. Therefore, my car must be the reason why the stoplight always changes. I know. One to 10, what do you think? Is it hasty generalization? Either or ba yun? Pag either or, dalawa lang ang possible na outcome. It's either this or that. Number nine, either or ba yun? The stoplight always turns red right before I reach the intersection. Parang ganito lang yan eh. Kapag naguhugas ako ng kotse, nagka-car wash ako, umuulan. Yung car wash ang tag nagiging cost talaga ng ulan. Kung gusto mong ulan, maglinis ka, umulan, maglinis ka ng kotse. This is generalization yan. In Filipino, every time I reach the intersection, the stoplight could turn red. So it's me reaching the intersection that turns the stoplight red. Post talk yun. Just because one event happened after another, ginawa mo ng cause noong second event, yung first event. So post talk yun. For sure, magkakaroon yan sa board exam. Kahit isa, dalawang question, meron yan. Okay. Next. Yeah, but na ulit. No slide. Okay. Now let's have linguistics and uh, structures of English language. Identify the sentence pattern. Jenny baked for weeks before the holidays. A. S. I. V. B. S. T. V. D. O. C. S. L. Sorry. Typographical area. S. L. V. C. Subject linking verb complement. And letter D, STVDO. Jenny baked for weeks before the holidays. Subject, ano yung IV? Intransitive verb. Letter B, subject, transitive verb, direct object. Letter C, subject, linking verb, complement. And letter D, subject, transitive verb. And then, hmm, pagkapareho pala. Okay. Transitive, it should be STVDO I O D O. But anyway, hindi niyo tamang sabat. What's the correct answer? Jenny baked for weeks. Ano sentence pattern nyo? Tanggalin niyo na yung letter D, kasi pareho sila ng ano letter D. A B C. What's the correct answer? Correct answer. Correct answer is letter Ayan. Correct po ulit. Sir JP Malapo. Okay. SIV. Subject intransitive verb. That's the sentence pattern. Okay. Let's have more exercises. Because the last time that we had this uh, this review, parang January yata or Feb pa nun, yung English then, major shift, um, it's an area of difficulty, yung sentence patterns. Okay. Ano-ano um, ba yung mga common sentence patterns? Number one, subject and itong verb na to, intransitive verb. Okay. Ano yung intransitive verb? An intransitive verb is a verb that does not have does not have an object. Okay. For example, the baby smiled. Okay, tapos na. Okay, hanggang doon lang. The baby smiled. The verb smiled does not need 
an object or cannot be an object. Pag naman transitive verb, the, the verb needs an object. I bought. It will not express a complete thought. Ano ang binili mo? I bought a car. So pag TV, transitive verb, it has an object. Kapag IV, in transitive verb, it does not have an object. Okay, now, what is an object? An object could be a direct object, indirect object, or object of preposition. Pag sinabi natin direct object, it's the thing acted on by the verb. So, it usually answers the question, what? Jack caught what? A fish. It is the thing acted on by the verb. When we say indirect object, it is the receiver of the action or the beneficiary of the action. Give her the fish. To whom are you going to give the fish? To her. The receiver of the action is her. So that's the indirect object. Sa object of preposition naman, it is the noun or could be the pronoun governed by a preposition. In this sentence, cook without salt. Without is a preposition. Okay, without what? Okay, salt. So um, salt there is the object of preposition. Okay. How about the LV? LV means linking verbs. So these are verbs that do not express action. They connect the subject of the verb to the additional information about the subject. What are those linking verbs? Could be the be verbs, is, are, was, were, am, okay, or yung mga uh, helping verbs like shall be, okay, grow, uh, shall be, might be, can be, should be, would have. Or verbs of the senses could also function as linking verbs. What are those verbs of the senses? Ano ba yung mga senses natin? Sense of touch, sense of sight, sense of smell, sense of hearing, sense of taste. So words like um, appear, okay, become, feel, okay, what else? Sound, taste, seem. Okay. For example, kasi, taste. The verb taste could be a verb of the senses and also a verb or an, an action verb. For example, John tasted the cake. So tasted there is an action verb. It's an action. Anong ginawa ni John? Sa cake. He tasted the cake. But when we say, the cake tastes good. So, taste there is a verb of the senses. Why? It links the subject, okay, the cake, to its complement, an adjective, which is good. The cake tastes good. So, you have to know the difference. Or for example, um, a ghost appeared a ghost appeared last night so a ghost appeared action for yon ano yung ginawa ng ghost uh, the ghost appeared but if you are going to use appear in this uh, in this way she appears calm so that is a linking verb it's a verb of the senses so she appears calm it connects she the subject to its complement an adjective called she appears called. So, yun yung mga SLVC. Subject, linking verb, and complement. Okay. Let's continue. I have here a sentence and I want you to determine its pattern. Bob looks very handsome in his new sweater. SIV, subject, intransitive verb. B, Subject, linking verb, complement, or subject complement. Letter C, STVDO, subject, transitive verb, and direct object. Letter D, STVIODO, subject, transitive verb, indirect object, and direct object. And STVDOOC, subject, transitive verb, direct object, and object complement. The object complement is, uh, it's, it could be an adjective phrase or adverb phrase. Bob looks handsome in his new sweater. What do you think?
Walang sagot. Mahirap. STVDO, sabi ni Ma'am Jawan. Okay. The correct answer is The subject is alam niyo na si Bob. Si looks. Looks is this an action verb or a linking verb? Transitive verb ba siya in transitive verb? Linking verb. It's the verb of the senses, 'di ba? Okay, it connects the subject to its complement. What is very handsome? Handsome is an adjective. So, si siya. Okay. Subject, linking verb, and complement. So, the correct answer is letter. What's happening sa screen? Yes. The correct answer is letter B. Subject, linking verb, and complement. So, looks there is a linking verb. It's a verb of the senses. Okay, next. A jockey rides race horses until he gets too old. Is it SIV, SLVC, STVDO, STVIODO, STVDOOC? What's the correct answer? A jockey rides race horses until he gets too old. The correct answer is, ayan, naguluhan na. Walang sumasagot. Mahirap. The correct answer is, letter C. A jockey, that's your subject, rides. That's your transitive verb because it has an object. Race horses. Rides what? Resources. So it is the, um, it answers the question what? So STVDO is the correct answer. Next, Mrs. Smith gave the kids some treats. Mrs. Smith gave the kids some treats. What's the subject? You know, nah, it's Mrs. Smith. You gave. Is it IV, LV, or TV? The correct answer is letter Ayad. Letter G is the correct answer. That is subject, transitive verb, si gave. The kids, the beneficiary. Kanino binigay sa kids? Ano ang ibinigay? Some treats. That's a direct object. That's why the correct answer is letter D. Next. Marlin had gone to the concert but left early. Marlin had gone to the concert but left early. Correct answer. Marlin, subject, had gone. Correct answer is Bakit naging direct object yung concert? The correct answer is subject intransitive verb. Wala naman siyang object. To the concert is a prepositional phrase. 
Okay? Uh, if you will look at the other side of it, left early. Marlin left. So it's subject in transitive verb. Okay, next. Paul paints portraits, not walls. Paul paints portraits, not walls. Paul paints portraits, not walls. What's the correct answer? Paul paints portraits, not walls. The correct answer is zero is a sentence structure. <laughs> Ayan. The correct answer is my phone would die. The correct answer is letter C. Okay, Paul, subject, paints. That's a transitive verb. Kasi it has an object. What does he paint? Portraits, not walls. So direct object. Letter C, S-T-V-D-O. Uh, next, we were all terrified by the accident. We were all terrified by the accident. What's the correct answer? We were all terrified by the accident. The correct answer is letter. Anina. Letter. Yes, it has to be letter B. Subject linking verb complement. Subject is we. Linking verb is were. Terrified is complement adjective. We were terrified. As simple as that. We were terrified. So subject, linking verb, and complement. Okay. Uh, now let's proceed to um, drama. Okay. What type of irony did Shakespeare Shakespeare use? Typographical error. My Edon. What type of irony did Shakespeare use in Anthony's speech? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. It's an excerpt from Julius Caesar, another tragedy written by William Shakespeare. Okay. What kind of irony was used? Is it a dramatic irony? A causal irony? Irony of situation? And, or verbal irony? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. Dramatic irony, causal irony, irony of situation, or verbal irony. The correct answer is... The correct answer is irony of situation. Why is this the correct answer? In general education, when we talk about figurative language, we often mention irony and we know right away it's sarcasm. Okay. However, digging deeper into irony, okay, we should know better because uh, this is our major. Digging deeper into irony, there are many kinds of it. Okay. An irony is a form of figure of speech in which a person delivering the ironic statement says something which is completely opposite to what they mean or what the reality of the situation is. And it could be classified into three. It could be verbal irony, situational irony, or dramatic irony. Well, let's talk about um, verbal irony. When someone uses a phrase that is 
verbal irony, they are expressing meaning which is contrary to the actual reality. Yun yung uh, usual na use ng irony. They may say something which is the complete opposite of what it is meant. For example, if it's raining, someone says, uh, someone would say, oh, what a lovely weather. Okay? Uh, when something is heavy, sabihin natin, ang bigat, oh, ang, uh, ang bigat, instead sabihin natin, ang bigat, ang gaan, ha? Sige, dagdagan mo pa. Okay? So that is a verbal irony. So that's the literal uh, use of irony or irony in its basic sense. Verbal irony. Next, we have dramatic irony. Dramatic irony occurs in everyday life when a situation is happening, yet the person within the situation is unaware of what is happening. So what makes it dramatic irony? Yung nandun sa situation, hindi niya alam na yun na pala yung situation. For example, if a person were to be mocking a friend for losing his wallet but did not realize that he also had lost his own wallet, this is a dramatic irony. Okay? We, all, we may also use this as a literary a uh, literary device. Okay, yung tao na dapat nararamdaman niya na nandun yung, yung ganun yung pangyayari sa sitwasyon, the first person to know the situation is not aware of it. So that's dramatic irony. How about situational irony? When used as a literary device, situational irony is something which refers to a situation regarding what is expected to happen and what actually happens. Okay. The irony lies with the expectation of the outcome of a situation when reality, something completely different occurs. Irony can be used in sarcastic senses to display the opposite meaning of what is happening in reality. For example, sa speech kanina ni Mark Anthony, when did the poor have cried? Caesar had wept. Ambition should be made with sterner staff. Why did he say that? Before Mark Antony delivered that speech in Julius Caesar, Brutus, the best friend of Caesar who joined the conspirator in killing Julius Caesar, delivered his uh, eulogy as well. Okay. What is the scenario there? In, the, um, in, in that funeral of Caesar, people were questioning the conspirators. The senators who killed Julius Caesar. He was a popular... Uh, popular um, Roman leader, si Julius Caesar. So it was a surprise for people of Rome nung pinatay siya ng mga conspirators, okay, ni, ni, um, mga pinatay sila kasama si Brutus ng mga conspirators na yun, which happened to be Caesar's best friend. So mga tao, they were angry. Okay, why did you kill Caesar? He, they considered Caesar a hero, a noble man of Rome. So uh, the goal of Brutus' speech was to explain why did I join the conspirator in killing Caesar? And his argument was, I killed Caesar for the good of Rome because he's starting to become too ambitious and he might soon become a dictator. Okay? So Roman Republic sila, Republic ang type of government nila. And yun yung iniiwasan nila. But because of Caesar's ambition, um, he will... Uh, eventually turned into a dictator. So, si Mark Anthony, he delivered a speech after Brutus. Kasi na-pacify na ng mga tao si Brutus eh. They accepted Brutus's uh, reasoning. Ah, okay. Kaya pala pinatay si Julius Caesar. It's, it's, it's for our own good. Okay. And then, came Mark Anthony, the, the supporter of Julius Caesar, he had to be very careful with, uh, with his words. Kasi nga, the conspirators might also kill him if he will say something against them. He asked permission if he could also deliver a eulogy for Julius Caesar. Okay. Uh, I will not say anything against you. I will just say something about uh, uh, my friend, uh, Julius Caesar. Ganun. Parang honoring the dead lang and that could be it. So um, you might be familiar with uh, Mark Antony's speech, yung Friends, Romans, countrymen, and lovers, I come to bury Caesar and not to praise him. Kaya yun yung opening lines na yan. I'm just here to bury the, the dead body of Julius Caesar. Okay? And I'm not here to, to praise him. Okay? I'm not here to praise uh, Julius Caesar. Kaya gusto yung pakinggan ng mga pumatay kay Julius Caesar. So hinayaan na nila si Mark Anthony to continue with his speech, which is a very big mistake. Kasi ang speech ni Mark Anthony, okay, 
um, in a subtle way, kinokontradict niya yung sinabi ni Brutus na he, uh, Caesar had been ambitious. Sabi niya, when that the poor have cried, Caesar have wept. Uh, nakikisama siya sa mga mahihirap. Ganun ba yung pagiging ambitious? Okay. So that's situational irony. Okay. That's uh, that's why it's the correct answer. Other examples of situation situational irony could be um in ayan, in Kate Chaplin's Chaplin story of an hour, we see situational irony when when a wife is so happy that her husband thought to be dead, but she can now live a free life. But when he arrives home, alive and well, she dies from the shock. Okay. Are you familiar with that uh, story, yung uh, uh, Chaplin story of an hour? Yung wife, um, namatay yung asawa niya. Instead of, if, instead of uh, mourning, grieving, she was happy about it because she wanted to marry another man. But then, uh, hindi pala totoong namatay yung husband niya. He went home okay, alive and well. Seeing, uh, seeing her husband alive, she was shocked and died of heart attack. So that's a situational irony. Okay. Or in the story, The Gift of the Maggie by O. Henry, everybody, I think lahat tayo, alam natin to. Okay, yung The Maggie by O. Henry. Alam niyo yun, yung uh, the wife cut off her hair to sell, his, to sell in in order that she might buy a watch chain for her husband. Parang, di ba? They loved each other so much. So, itong si, si husband, she has a, a watch, yung, yung luma na na watch, parang, tawag, parang antique, um, kaso walang chain. So, the husband sold his priceless possession para mabilan niya ng comb, ng supply yung wife niya as, as a gift. Ito naman si wife, out of his out of her love for for her husband, she sold her hair, okay? Pinutol niya, pinaput niya book niya and then she sold it in order for for her to buy a new chain for his uh, for her husband's watch. So, ayan, meron na si si husband gift na na comb for for the wife. Si wife naman may gift na na chain for the husband. Kaso wala na yung hair, wala na din yung watch. So that's situational irony. That's how writers used it. Okay. Um, additional information about Julius Caesar. Again, this is a possible question in literature. Let's talk about this Julius Caesar's plot. Nasabi ko naman na kanina, yung about the, 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 the play. Julius Caesar is a highly successful but ambitious political leader of Rome. And, and his goal is to become an assassin an assailable dictator. Caesar, Caesar is warned by a soothsayer. Ang sabi sa kanya ng soothsayer, beware of the Ides of March. Okay. Oh, beware of March 14. The prophecy comes true and Caesar is assassinated. Marcus Brutus is a well-respected Roman senator who helps uh, and carry out Caesar's assassination, which he believes will read Rome of a tyrant. Caesar's friend Mark Antony provides the famous funeral oration. Friends, Romans, and countrymen, and Brutus and Cassius meet their inevitable defeat. Brutus, the noble Roman, whose decision to take part in the conspiracy for the sake of freedom, plunges his country into civil war. Okay, sino naman si Cassius? Si Cassius talaga siya yung galit kay, uh, kay Julius Caesar. Parang binrainwash niya si Brutus to believe na we have to kill Julius Caesar okay, for the good of Rome. Kasi si, 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 si Brutus, uh, very patriotic siya. So he is from a noble family kasi yung, yung, mga, yung mga ancestors ni Brutus, uh, mga noblemen of Rome. So kailangan ni, ni Cassius ng cooperation ni Brutus for the assassination. But magkaiba sila ng motive. Cassius simply hated Caesar. Si Brutus naman, he's a best friend to Caesar. So, ang ginamit niyang tack is to brainwash Brutus. Gawin natin to for the good of Rome. So, he joined the conspirator na explain ni Brutus sa uh, Romans kung bakit niya pinatay si Caesar. Okay na sana. Then spoke Mark Anthony na buhay ngayon. 
yung love ng mga Roman sa kay Julius Caesar and that caused a civil war. So nagkaroon tuloy ng civil war sa Rome. Ending, sino ang nanalo sa civil war? Uh, natalo yung troops ni Brutus at saka ni, uh, ni Cassius. So ang nayare Brutus, okay, nung, uh, yun na talaga, talo na sila, he committed uh, suicide by running towards his, his sword. So yun, uh, sinaksak niya yung sarili niya. Okay, tumakbo siya towards his sword. So yun, yung play na Julius Caesar. That's why it's called a tragedy. It involves uh, death of the main characters. Okay. Why is this also a significant literary piece for you to learn? Kasi ito yung usually ginagamit na springboard in teaching Aristotle's persuasive appeal or yung art of persuasion. Okay. For sure, you have uh, came across this art of persuasion or persuasive appeal in your um, purposive communication subject in college as well as in your um, discourse analysis. According to Aristotle, for you to be effective in persuasion, okay, for you to persuade people, you should meet all these three appeals to persuasion. Okay? You should have ethos, pathos, and logos. Ano ba yung ethos, pathos, and logos? Logos means appeal to reason or appeal to logic. So what is the technique used by by speakers in order to appeal to reasoning. So if you're appealing to reasoning, you try to convince your listeners by presenting factual evidences. So if you're a speaker and you want to appeal to, to, to logos, to the intellect of your listener, magsalita ka, magbigay ka ng results ng statistics, results ng mga studies. Okay? And... Um, you try to make them accept your reasoning or accept your stand because of facts, factual reasoning. That's logos. Ethos naman is appeal to credibility or trust. People are persuaded by other people whom they trust. So if you want to appeal to ethos, you have to establish your branding or your credibility. Anong ginagawa nun? People would... Kapag sira ang reputation ng isang tao, wala siyang appeal to ethos. Okay? Or, ang ginagawa ng ibang speaker, nagmi-mention sila ng mga tao na may credibility in order to persuade the listeners. So that's appeal to ethos. You cite credible sources or people of authority. Maniwala kayo kasi according to kay, uh, according to kay Dr. Willie Ong. O ganyan. So appeal yun to, to ethos. When we say pathos, that's appeal to emotions. People are persuaded because the, the speaker successfully moved or successfully appealed to their emotions. So pag sinabi natin emotions, napapaiyak yung nakikinig or nagagalit, napapatawa, that's still appeal to emotion. And how do speakers do that effectively? By citing stories, okay, by using Um, vivid language or language that appeal to the emotion. So, yun daw yung three persuasive appeals. If you want to be successful in persuasion, dapat daw ang speech mo or yung argument mo, meron yung tatlo na yun. Okay. What is the connection to uh, to the speech uh, to Julius Caesar? Okay. If you could see there, dun sa speech ni Brutus, Brutus is an honorable man. So, he has credibility. So there is automatically appeal to ethos. Okay? In order for him to persuade the people of Rome, he appealed to reason. Okay, isipin ninyo, okay? Who is here so uh, who is here so base that would be a bond one? Speak for whom have I invented? Sino pa sa inyo ang gustong maging mga alipin? Parang pinapaintindi niya sa mga sa mga Roman. So ang ginawa niya in persuading is appeal to logos. At first it was successful. But when uh, Mark Anthony spoke, appeal naman to emotions ang ginawa niya. Super drama siya. Uh, umiiyak siya uh, when he was talking about Caesar. He showed uh, the Caesar's bloody clothes. Okay, ito yung, ano, yung, yung damit niya, punong-punong ng dugo. So parang sobrang naawa yung mga Romans uh, kay Caesar. And he reminded him 
of Caesar's love for the Romans. Okay. I have here the will of Caesar. Okay, let me read the yung last will of testament of Caesar, which stated that when he dies, um, part of his or a huge part of his wealth would go to the people of Rome or will be donated to the people of Rome. Nung nalaman niyo ng mga Romans, ayun na, okay, nagalit na sila sa mga conspirators and that sparked the civil war. So, mas na naig or mas nag-succeed yung appeal to pathos or appeal to emotions. So, ayun. Sa itas din kasi, credible din si Mark Antony. Noble man of Rome din siya. So, that's it. Um, you might be asked questions about this uh, persuasive appeal by Aristotle. Okay. Next, to test if you understood uh, yung mga pinagsasabi ko about persuasive appeals, let's answer this question. Which of the following would be a technique that implements logos? A, using pictures of a hurt child. Letter B, including research. Letter C, having someone credible who agrees with you. Letter D, making people laugh. Which of the following would be a technique that implements logos? A, using pictures of a hurt child. Letter B, including research. Letter C, having someone credible who agrees with you. Or letter D, people make people laugh. Okay. So let's see. Okay. The correct answer is letter, yes, letter B, include research, appeal to reasoning. So uh, using, uh, citing, uh, citing uh, credible facts, ayan, reliable, uh, reliable information. Okay, let's see. It's the letter A. When you show pictures of a hurt child, ano ba yun? Ethos, pathos, or logos? Nagtuturo ka. Ang uh, ipapakita mo picture ng isang bata na, uh, na nasaktan. Or for example, yung ano, ano ba yun? Yung bata na nagkaararo ng bukid, maliit pa lang, tapos it, it received uh, so much response okay, from from the viewers. Ang daming nag-donate. So ano ba yung, anong appeal yun? When you show pictures of a hurt child, that's appeal to what? Anong focus nun sa art of persuasion? Appeal to emotion. Correct. Ethos, pathos, logos. When you're appealing to emotion, pathos, pathos, okay. ano yun? When you're appealing to emotion, ethos, pathos, or pathos, or logos? Hindi nga logos. Oh. Dalawa na lang. Ethos uh, or, or pathos. Okay, pathos yun. Having someone credible who agrees with you. Having someone credible who agrees with you. Di ba ganun? Sa networking, para makakuha sila ng, ano, ng mga recruits. O oh, ito yung mga, ito yung president namin. Si ano nga eh, yung mga personalities kasama din namin dito. Okay, so yun. Ethos yun. When you make people laugh, Pag ang speaker, uh, yung mga politiko, papatawanin yung mga nakikinig, pathos pa din yan. Okay, hindi naman ibig sabihin, iiyak lang. Okay, uh, yun lang yung appeal to emotion. Even making other people's laugh, other people laugh for you to be likable sa audience, appeal to emotions pa din yan, pathos pa din. Okay, let's have number 26. Which two sound devices did Alexander Pope Use in the following lines. Soft is the strain when Sephir gently blows, and the smooth stream in smoother number flows. But when loud surges lash the sounding shore, the horror's wrath verse should like the torrent roar. A. Assonance and consonance. Poetry naman tayo. B. Alliteration and onomatopoeia. C. Consonance and Cacophony, D, onomatopoeia, and consonants. Again, okay. which two sound devices did Alexander Pope use in the following lines? Did he use assonance and consonants, alliteration and onomatopoeia, consonants and cacophony, 
onomatopoeia and consonants? What's your answer? Okay, the correct answer is What's happening? Oh, wait, it's not responding. Okay. I just have some technical problems. Are you recall? Ano na nga ba yung mga assonance and consonants? Anong tawag natin sa mga to? Assonance, consonants, alliteration, onomatopoeia. What do we call them? Please answer sa chat box. What do we call these? Saan natin ginagamit to sa poetry? At bakit tayo gumagamit ng ganda sa poetry? The correct answer is alliteration and onomatopoeia. And all these options are called sound devices. Okay. Sound devices are special tools that poet can use to create ayan, certain effects in the poem to convey and reinforce meaning through sound. Okay. Ang sound device would include uh, or would include the following rhyme. In poetry, rhyme is used to echo sounds. One word sounds like the other. Alam na natin yun, yung mga Rhyme words call the attention to each other. So they can carry more weight. While rhyme poetry has not been particularly popular in the last 40 years. Some writers use it often. In fact, it makes it easier for listeners to remember the words and also help carry them. Kosu's use of rhyme can bring a subtle emphasis to particular words. Example, he never wanted to fly because he didn't want to die. What are the rhyming words here? Fly and die. Okay, why do poets use rhyming? Okay, number one. A uh, rhyme is, is helpful for retention. Listeners or uh, readers can easily recall or remember the lines of a poem or a song if there are rhyming words. Okay, what else? Um, rhyme adds appeal to, uh, to a, a poetic piece. Okay, although, ngayon, um, nagiging free verse na mga poetry. So, hindi na katulad before that that all poems usually involve rhyming. Ngayon, free verse na, tuluyan na ang mga, ang mga poems. Right? Rhymes can be classified into, uh, would have many classifications as well. We have yung end rhyme. Yung the last word of one line would rhyme with the last word of another rhyme. Yun yung end rhyme. Ito, example kayo na to, they never wanted to fly because they didn't because he didn't want to die. The rhyming words are fly and die. So rhyming happens within the same line. That is what we call as internal rhyme. Kapag rhyming takes place within the same line of a poem, that's internal rhyme. If the last word of, the, of one line rhymes with the last word of another line, that is what we call as end rhyme. The okay, rhythm is essential in poetry and often in, and often in prose because rhythmic refer, this refers to the regular or progressive pattern of accents in lines or sentences. Rhythm helps with the flow of words. The measure of rhythm is meter. 
Ano ba yung mga rhythm? Yun yung mga succession of sounds. For example, in Shakespeare's sonnet, we call it pentameter. Okay? Ang measure ng rhythm ay meter. Bakit siya naging pentameter? There are five uh, pairs of stress and unstressed syllables in one line. Kaya siya naging pentameter because there are five pairs of uh, stress and unstressed syllable or five iams in one line. Okay, what else? Aside from a meter, we have this euphony. Euphony are lines that are musically pleasant to the ear. There is harmony and beauty to the language, which is uh, what many poets are often after. For example, this Emily Dickinson's poem, A Bird Came Down to, to the Walk has the effect as seen in the last stanza. Okay, for here, then oars divide the ocean to silver for a scene, or butterflies of banks of moon leave flashless as they swim. Parang fluid yung, uh, yung, mga, yung continuity ng words. So that's euphony. Parang music sa ears kapag binabasa aloud yung poem. How about cacophony? Ang cacophony is the opposite of euphony. A jarring, jangling, juxtaposition of words can be used to bring attention to. Cacophony is discordant language that can be difficult to pronounce. Yung cacophony, it's actually a technique used in tongue twisters, di ba? Um, to test your pronunciation, you are given series of words that are hard to, to pronounce. So cacophony yung technique na ginagamit sa tongue twisters. My stick fingers click with a snicker and chuckling they chuckle that tease. Um, Light-footed when st uh, my steel feelers flicker and flap from sea keys melodies. Okay. Ano po ba yung mga tang twisters natin? Yung a wood chuck chuck, yan, yan. So tang twister yan. Cacophony yan. Next. Um, onomatopoeia are words whose sound is suggestive of its meaning. For example, Caesar. Uh, boom, buzz, uh, cuckoo, and mm. All right. um, repetition naman, uh, lines, words, or phrases are repeated in a poem to have the desired effect. An example is stopping by the woods but in a snow, on a snowy evening. Like this one by Robert Frost, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Okay, parang nakatulog na siya. Yun yung effect niya. Um, repetition. Next, alliteration. It's the repetition of the initial consonant sounds of stress syllable. For example, wordlessly, which, uh, wordlessly, okay, so now, wordlessly watching the weights by the window. Repetition of the consonant W. Okay. In wonders of the empty place, heartlessly helping himself to her bad dreams. Repetition of letter H, heartless, helping himself, her. So repetition of consonant sounds in the beginning of words, that's alliteration. Pag assonance, it's a repetition of internal vowel sound create, that creates assonance. For example, asleep under a tree. So repetition of the long E sound, asleep under a tree. Pag consonants naman, it's also a repetition of consonants, pero hindi lang sa beginning. Could be in the middle or last part of the word. Okay? Again, pag alliteration, repetition of consonant sounds in the beginning of words. Example nun, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. Diba? Repetition of letter P. Okay. Ang assonance naman, repetition of vowel sounds. Okay, pag consonants naman, repetition ulit ng consonants, pero hindi lang sa beginning. Okay, oftentimes sa middle or last part of the word. Okay, let me, ayan, bakit na ulit? Let me test. Bakit naging alliteration and onomatopoeia? Ano ba yung mga consonants repeated in the beginning of words? Soft, yung repetition of S. Soft. Strain, gently blow, smooth stream, and smoother number flows. Okay, sarges sounding. 
So repetition siya ng consonants sa beginning of words. Ano yung mga onomatopoeia doon? Words that is suggestive of its sound. Yung slash, horse, okay, roar. So those are the onomatopoeia part of the or onomatopoeia effect in those verses. Okay, let's practice. I have here um, the poem, a poem by Lewis Carroll. I want you to determine what particular sound device was used by Lewis Carroll. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jab jab bird and shun the Fumius Bandersnatch. So is it rhyming, consonants, assonance, alliteration, euphony, cacophony, or onomatopoeia? You can read the, you can read the verse as silently and determine kung anong um kung anong sound device yung ginamit. We wear the jabber walk, the jabber walk, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. We wear the jab jab bird and shun the frumious bander snatch. What's your answer? Consonants ba siya? Hindi eh. Ano siya? The correct answer is. Rhyme. Ah, pwede siyang rhyme kasi nga meron siyang sun and shun, catch and bandersnatch, okay? and rhyme yung tinatawag natin niya. But yung kabuan din ng verse, aside from its rhyming, it's also considered as, nakita ko yung tamang sagot kayo na, Ma'am Annaline Lazo, Tribiana. It's also an example of cacophony. Ay, you know, may mga parts. Okay, ayan. Okay, jabber walk my son. The jab jab bird and shan. Okay, so that's it. Next. Yeah, yun yung rhyme scheme niya. A, B, A, B. This one naman. From Acquainted with the Night by Robert Frost. I have stood still and stopped the sound of... I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet. Rhyme, consonants, assonance, alliteration, euphony, cacophony, or onomatopoeia. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet. What's your answer? Ma'am Juliet, sure ka sa alliteration. Ma'am Juliet, sure ka um, sa alliteration? I, um, I think so, ma'am, because I look for the word stood still and stop. Okay, if it's alliteration, repetition of consonant sounds in the beginning of words, anong consonant ang repeated many times? S T. Okay, the S, the S, stood, still, stop, and sound. Okay, correct. That is alliteration. Let's have this next one. Proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. Again, proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been acquainted with the night. Uh, pwede din siyang rhyme kasi end rhyme. It's an example of an end rhyme. Yung right at night. Aside from the rhyming, okay, ano pa ang sound device dito? Proclaim the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one at the of the night. Aside from rhyming, ano pa? Aside from rhyming, The correct answer is B. 
here for me. Pag euphony, parang music for the ears, eh. Yes, correct, Sir Dennis. This is actually assonance. Sir Dennis, ano ba ang mga uh, vowels na na-repeat dito sa dalawang lines na to? Ano ang mga dominant na vowels? Yung ano po, yung sa word na pro proclaim, tapos yung time, yung I-M-E, tapos po dun sa right po, tapos night. Okay, that's right. Now repeat ang mga vowels na A and O. So that makes it assonance. Okay, so I think we will be stopping right there. Those are the different sound devices in, in poetry. So remember uh, remember those. Um, ang lawak ng scope ng English majorship exam. And... In the options that I have provided earlier, pinaghalo-halo ko na yung mga terminologies. So we can, uh, we can discuss different areas. But still, um, I don't think this would suffice. Balikan nyo pa yung mga terminologies, yung ano pang mga, uh, mga different areas in English. Oh, so far, marami tayong na-review sa campus journalism and also with... Uh, stylistic, stylistics and discourse analysis, same with uh, literature and structures of English. And I think as we were doing the review, nakita nyo na kung ano yung mga errors na nakalimutan nyo na, na napag-aralan nyo uh, sa school, nung college, pero yan. Okay. Uh, yes, you're welcome, Ma'am Juliet. So alam nyo na, eto pala yung, nga pala yung mga lessons namin. At least you, will, you were reminded of the terminologies if you still have notes, Okay, when you were in college or if you can read more books, the sobrang lawa kasi ng scope. Um, the items that we have covered, although madami, okay, hindi pa natin mag-guarantee na uh, where, kung saan manggagaling ang mga questions. Okay, but anyway, we still have a few more days to review. And let's maximize uh, the time and the learning. So thank you very much for uh, staying with me in the um, past three hours. Yes, my soft copy talk. And aside from this presentation, I'm also providing you yung uh, glossary ng mga campus journalism jargons. Kasi yung mga jargons talaga sa campus, ang dami nila. Okay? Ang hirap i-memorize lahat. If you are working sa campus paper, if you are one of the staffers sa campus paper, Good, no college. So you may be very much familiar with this. Pero kung na-encounter na lang natin yung mga terminologies na yon sa campus term during our class, most likely mga nakalimutan na natin. So I'm providing also yung list of uh, jargons used in campus journalism for everybody's uh, reference. Okay? So that's the end of our review. Thank you very much for your participation, for your listening. I hope you have a good night. Stay safe and goodbye, everybody.